In this data set, I talk about how much companies owe, broken down by industry again. To put it in context, let's step back. A company can be defined in terms of what it owns, assets in place, investments it's already made, and growth assets, investments it's expected to make in the future. There are only two ways you can fund the business. You can borrow the money, debt, or you can use your own money equity. The key differences between debt and equity lie in, uh, in two areas. The first is debt gives rise to a contractual claim on the cash flows. When a lender lends money to you as a company, you have to make interest payments or principal payments. And if you don't, you could be in default. Equity investors get a residual cash flow. In other words, if you expect a dividend, you don't get paid a dividend, you can't sue because you're contractually not entitled to dividends. The other difference is in return for getting residual claims, equity investors usually pick the managers who run the company or run the company themselves. Lenders are outsiders. They provide, they have contractual protection in the form of covenants, but they can't do much more. Now with that, with that background, let's talk about measuring debt at companies. Now, I could compare dollar debt values across companies, but it would be meaningless. So to get measures that you can compare across companies, I use three scalars. First, I scale debt to total capital, debt plus equity, or to just equity. Debt divided by equity is called the debt to equity ratio. Debt divided by capital, which is debt divided by debt plus equity, is a debt to capital ratio. Each has its use, and I'll talk about those in a moment, but I report both ratios. As a debt can also be scaled to cash flows. And the simplest and most accessible cash flow that you can think about for a firm is earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, amortization. So I look at total debt as a percentage of EBITDA. The lower this number, the less debt a company carries. So a company that carries 500 million in debt for 100 million EBITDA has a total debt to EBITDA of five meaning that, it, has to, that it, it owes five times more dollars than it generates each year in cash flows. Now, I can also look at the interest expense portion of debt and scale it to the earnings of a company. It's called an interest coverage ratio, where you take the earnings before interest and taxes and divide by interest expense. So those are the three key scalars you'll see me report. Now, that said, though, there are choices I have to make in how I compute debt. First, I have to decide whether to go to book value, which is what you see in accounting balance sheets, accounting shareholders equity, which is accounting value of equity, and accounting debt, or market values. For equity, for a publicly traded company, that's just market capitalization. For debt, if the company has bonds that are traded, I could look up market value, but for many companies, the book debt is a reasonable approximation for the market value. Now, the reason I compute the market debt, cap debt ratios is they have uses in corporate finance. The debt to capital ratio based on market values is what used for the cost of capital calculation. The debt to equity ratio in market value terms is what I use for levered beta. So if you use those data sets of mine, you will see these ratios show up. You're saying, why bother with book values? Nothing else because some people prefer to use book ratios. In fact, many services, when they report the debt ratio for a company, report book debt ratios. So if you're wondering why my debt ratios are different from what you might find in Yahoo Finance, this might be the reason. Now, book debt ratios do have a use, especially when it comes to computing accounting returns. Now, this might be getting ahead of myself if you haven't looked at the accounting return data set, but I report return in equity and return invested capital. And the two are linked together. By what? By how much a company borrows. And here it's the book debt to equity that matters and what its after-tax cost of borrowing is, again, based on book borrowing. So debt to debt ratios can be computed in market or book, or book basis. Now, incidentally, when you compute debt to capital, debt over debt plus equity, that number cannot be less than 0%. It cannot exceed 100%. If you're doing debt to equity, though, it cannot be less than 0%, obviously, but it can. there's no upper bound. Debt, rate, debt can be 9 times, 15 times, 20 times equity at highly levered companies. There's another component of debt that is, that is worth talking about. I know we, when you talk about debt, remember debt can be short-term debt or long-term debt. And for whatever reason, some people prefer to look at long-term debt ratios. I think it's a mistake, but there are debt ratios you can compute with just long-term debt. Now, if you're looking at a balance sheet, long-term debt is debt that will show up separately from, from short-term debt, because short-term debt, which can include short-term borrowings and the short-term portion of long-term debt, will show up usually under current liabilities. 
So long-term debt and short-term debt are both interest-bearing debt. Now, starting in 2019, IFRS and GAAP is requiring companies to take their lease commitments and convert them to debt and shorten the balance sheet. I've been doing this for 30 years of converting lease commitments to debt. I continue to do it for companies where IFRS and GAAP don't apply. So my definition of total debt includes long-term and short-term debt, all interest-bearing debt and lease debt. You know what it doesn't include? Non-interest-bearing debt, things like accounts payable, supplier credit, those go into working capital and those are not treated as part of debt in all of my debt calculations. There's one final divide. It's a divide between gross debt and net debt. You're saying, what's the difference? Gross debt is the total debt due. Net debt is a gross debt net of the cash and marketable securities that that company has. So if a company has 500 million in gross debt and 200 million in cash, 500 minus 200 is your net debt. Note already that while gross debt cannot be less than zero, net debt can be negative. Why? Because cash can exceed debt. If you have $100 million in cash and only $50 million in debt due, your net debt can be minus $50 million, which makes, means all your net debt ratios to capital can be negative when you have negative net debt. Now, there are some analysts who argue that net debt is a better measure of, level, of how much a company owes than gross debt because they can use the cash to pay down the debt. But recognize that the cash can very quickly leave the firm if they do an acquisition or a buyback and a company can overnight go from looking lightly indebted on a net debt basis to highly indebted. So I report both gross debt and net debt ratios, but I focus in on the gross debt ratios because to me, those are much better indicators of long-term leverage than looking at net debt ratios that can go up and down depending on what's happening to the cash balance. I hope you find this data set useful. Thank you very much for listening.